This is a classical physics two. And we're doing a chapter 19 problems. And the first guy we're going to look at is number six. Number six says, um, I have a immersion heater that's going to heat at um, 350 watts. And I want to heat up some soup. And uh, the volume of my soup is going to be uh, 0.25 liters. And I want to go from 15 degrees centigrade to uh, 75 degrees centigrade, which implies my uh, delta T is going to be 60 degrees centigrade. Okay, well, this turns out to be a, a dimensional analysis type problem. Um, so I've got um, 0.25 liters. Um, the soup is basically water, and I, so I've got one kilogram per one liter of water. Um, it takes one kilocalorie to uh, heat one kilogram, one degree. One kilogram, one degree. And uh, it's um, 41865, uh, 4186. 4186 joules per kilocalorie. And we note that uh, a watt is um, joules per second. So this is 350 joules per second. Um, so we'll multiply this by um, 1 over 350 joules per second. And when we do our dimensional analysis, we see that liters go away and kilograms go away. And um, we forgot the delta T. Why did we forget the delta T? times 60 degrees centigrade equals. Okay, that's that's much better. All right, where was I? Uh, degrees centigrade goes away, joules go away, kilocalories go away, and the only thing we have left over is uh, an answer in um, seconds. All right, so I'll take out our calculator and see what we get. 0.25, and we get uh, about 180 seconds, 179.4 seconds. Um, so we'll call it 180 seconds, and that uh, would give us three minutes. Um, let's see now. We have two significant digits. Okay, so that would have to round up 3.0 minutes. And we call that our final answer. Next problem. Number 10. Two samples of copper and aluminum at water experience the same temperature rise. Right, so um, big deal, delta T is the same. Uh, when they absorb the same amount of heat, what is the ratio of their masses? Okay, so I want the ratio of their masses. All right, so um, heat is going to be uh, mass times specific heat times delta T. So mass is going to be um, Q divided by M delta T. Okay, so we have, uh, we want the ratio of the mass of the copper 
to the mass of the aluminum. Okay, and that's going to be um, Q divided by um, that. Um, where did that come from? Pacific heat. Okay, so Pacific heat of the copper uh, delta T divided by Q divided by Pacific heat of the aluminum delta T. Now the heat absorbed is is the same, so the uh, the Q's go away and the delta T's are the same, and so the uh, we end up having the Pacific heat of the aluminum divided by the Pacific heat of the copper as being our ratio and um, what do we think that is anyway um, are we supposed to be doing water too oh we have three of them we have masses of the water too okay so um, So we have to do um, something slightly different, slightly different. All right, so we'll erase all that and try something a little bit different. And we'll say that the uh, mass of the copper uh, is... Um, as the same uh, ratioed with the mass of the aluminum and mass of the water because okay, we want water too. Okay, so they're going to have um, Q over C, um, Cu, Pacific heat of the copper, um, delta T. Um, is a ratio with the Q Pacific heat of the aluminum, delta T Q Pacific heat of the water, delta T. If I could make a T, and then uh, we said, well, gee, I got um, the same heat and the same of that guy. And now I can have um, 1 over um, 390 um, joules per degree centigrade divided by 1 over uh, 900 um, in ratio with 1 over 4186. And then I could go and put those things in my calculator and say, well, that's 11 to uh, approximately 4.7 to 1. And then uh, because I rounded off some, I would make this a squiggly line there because I'm approximately that ratio. Okay, well, that was uh, too easy. Maybe we'll do better next time. Number 16. Number 16, uh, the heat capacity C of an object is defined as the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature at 1 degree centigrade. Thus, to raise the temperature delta T requires heat um, Q C delta T. Okay, well, we knew that. Write the heat capacity C in terms of Pacific heat. All right, well, capital C, my heat capacity is MC, so if I was going to write it in terms of Pacific heat, I'd say um, Q is equal to um, M little c delta T. And that would be my A answer. Um, hmm. Write the capacity wrong. Not yet. C, oh, right there it is, right there, A. I already have it. I just went too far. B, 
One is the heat capacity of one kilogram of water. All right, so the heat capacity of one kilogram of water would be 1.0 kilogram times uh, 4186 joules per kilogram degrees centigrade. Um, when we only have two significant digits, so we're drawing it off to um, 4200 joules per degree centigrade. And um, 3.5 degree uh, kilograms of water. So uh, C would do it again. Um, 3.5 kilograms. Actually, it's 35 kilograms if I were to read the book property properly. 35 kilograms times uh, 4186 joules per kilogram centigrade degree. And uh, if I want to put that in my calculator and say, well, you know, I only have two significant digits, 1.5 times 10 to the fifth joules per centigrade degree. And that would be my C part to the answer. Number 20. A 35 gram cube of ice. Okay, so mass of the ice and I probably don't want gram, I probably want kilogram, 0 0.035 kilograms. Um, and it's melting point, so I'm at uh, 0 degrees centigrade. Um, is dropped into an isolated cylinder of liquid nitrogen. How much nitrogen evaporates if it has a boiling point of 77 Kelvin. Okay, so the boiling point is 77 K of the nitrogen. Isn't that nice? Um, and it has a latent heat of the nitrogen is um, 2,000 kilojoules per kilogram. Assume for, Pacific, uh, for simplicity, simplicity that the Pacific heat of the ice is constant and is equal to or near the value at its melting point. Okay. So that means that um, I've got some uh, mass of the ice. And if I take the mass of the ice times the Pacific heat of the ice times the delta T that I'm uh, going to happen to the, the ice, then uh, I should have um, some mass of the nitrogen being evaporated away times the latent heat of the uh, nitrogen. So that's the equation that I'm solving. Um, so I'm going I'm to rewrite it and say the mass of the nitrogen, which is what I'm trying to calculate, is going to be um, the mass of the ice, the uh, Pacific heat of the ice, delta T, divided by the latent heat evaporization of the nitrogen gas. Okay, now it's time to put in our, our numbers. So I've got uh, 0 0.035 kilograms of ice. I have uh, 2100 uh, 
joules per kilogram centigrade degree for my specific heat. My delta T is going to be 0 minus the uh, 196 degrees centigrade, which is what the 77K is. And then I'm going to divide that by um, 2, what is it, 200, 200 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, and now I look at my dimensions and I see that joules will go away and uh, that kilogram goes away and the centigrade guys goes away. And I end up with some amount of nitrogen gas vaporizing. Okay, well, um, 0 0.035 times 2100 times 196, I'm neglecting the minus guy, divided by 200 doubly 3, and it looks like I've got um, the two significant digits anyway, I'm going to have uh, 72 grams is what I'm going to have evaporating away of uh, the nitrogen gas as the piece of ice gets colder. Okay, number um, 26. Um, a 58 kilogram ice skater. Okay, so I've got the uh, mass of my ice skater. 58 kilograms. Mm -hmm. Is moving at 7.5 meters per second to a stop. Okay, so we're going 7.5 meters per second. And I'm going to zero, okay. Assuming the ice is at zero degrees and that 50% of the heat generated by friction is absorbed by the ice, how much ice will melt? Okay, so we're gonna to wanna to find the kinetic energy of this ice skater before we start. So that's one half mass velocity squared, one half 58, times 7.5 meters per second squared. All right, and then we'll come up with that number and just set it on the side. 0. 0.5 times 58 times uh, 7.5 squared. So I'll call that um, 1.63 kilojoules. Okay, so that's the kinetic energy. Now, um, half of that kinetic energy is melting the hot ice. So half of that kinetic energy will be, um, we'll call it 816 joules. And that's what's being used to melt the ice. Now, um, the amount of ice that's going to be melted. All right, so I've got um, 816 joules being melted, and that's going to be um, the uh, mass of the person, the mass of the ice being melted, times the latent heat of the ice. And I'd have to go look that up because I don't remember it. Um, kilograms 333 three, three kilojoules per kilogram
kilogram. All right. All right, well, um, ma the uh, mass of the ice that is melted, 816 joules divided by 333 kilojoules per kilogram. Dimensional analysis says my answers will be in kilograms. Um, okay, I already have that in my calculator, 8. 333 E3 is what I'm dividing by. And it looks like I have 2.4 times 10 to the third. 2.4 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms of ice will be melted by the ice skater. Okay, now we're looking at problem number. 32. 32. The pressure volume diagram below shows two possible states of a system containing 1.55 moles of a monoatomic ideal gas. Okay, so. Um, So the number of moles I have is 1.55 and um, my pressure 1 is going to be equal to my pressure 2 which is 455 newtons per meter squared. My volume 1 is going to be 2.00 meters cubed. My volume 2 is going to be 8 meters cubed. Those are all given things. Okay, now we have to draw the process. Okay, so we're going to go and uh, make a graph. And um, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 meters cubed. And um, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. Not much room there, is there? I should have did that better. I'll move these guys up for 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. That's better. Uh, 500 down to 100. And this is uh, newtons per meter squared. All right, so. We start in position 1, which is about there, and position 2 is about there. All right, so that being the case, draw the process which, predict, which uh, depicts an isobaric expansion. So that means we're going to keep the, um, the volume the same. as we expand iso no we keep the isobaric means we keep the pressure the same okay so we're going to go isobaric expansion from there to there okay so that's what we're going to do first we're going to call this point a we're going to call that line a um, yeah the, this process is a all right so we did that fine Process A. Okay, we did that. Find the work done by the gas and the change in internal energy of process A. Okay, so we're, we're down to part B now. So we're looking at part B and we want the, uh, the work done. So the work is uh, the pressure change in volume. And our pressure was uh, 455 newtons per meter squared. And our change in volume was 8 meters cubed minus 2 meters cubed. 
Um, looks like two seven three zero joules. All right, so that's the the work done by the gas and the change in internal energy. All right, so I'm going to use uh, PV is equal to nRT. And we're going to and we're going to use that um, the change in internal energy and uh, we see that this is 196197 for for section numbers and we go back to 196 and we find um, that um, change in internal energy any good equation. Oh, there it is. I see one. All right. Is equal to two, three halves. Three halves M, N, number of moles, R, delta, T, which is going to be uh, three halves n r t two minus n r t one. And we can arrange that and say that's three over two because P V is equal to N R T we can say that this is going to be P V 2 minus P V 1 which is 2 3 halves 3 halves pressure change in volume so that's how we would, would calculate my change in eternal energy and then we'd say well PV change in V this is just work so this would be um, I'm not dividing by work there I'm just pointing out that it is work um, so I my internal energy is going to be two three halves three halves of the work done so uh, three halves uh, 270, 2730 joules will give me uh, 4.1 times 10 to the third joules. And so that's my change in internal energy. Now C wants me to do draw the two step process which depicts an isothermal expansion from state 1 to volume 2 V2 followed by an iso uh, volumetric increase in temperature to state 2 label this process B okay so we're going to move back up to our chart we had okay so we're going to go and um, do a ISO thermal guide there, and then we're going to do we're going to go that way. So we're going to go like that and like that, and call that B, and that will be a ISO thermal expansion followed by an isovolumetric increase. Okay, so we're going to go there, and then we're going to increase like that. Okay, so that's B. Okay, so that's the, the C part of my answer is in blue. I'm going to move back down, and I'm going to do the D part. 
in the D part, find the change in internal energy of the gas for the two-step process. Change of internal energy. And uh, change in internal energy. So we're gonna we're gonna instead of instead of going that way, we're gonna go this way and find it. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. That's the plan. Well, uh, the internal energy, um, the the change in internal energy only depends on the uh, final temperature. final temperatures and the initial temperatures. That being the case, um, they're both the same. So um, the change in internal energy is going to be the same as it was in part B. So we'll go back up to B and uh, we'll put it 4100 joules so it looks slightly different but it, it is in fact the same. And that was problem number 32. Now we're going to do problem number 40. Problem number 40. Suppose a gas is taken clockwise around the rectangle shown in figure 1932 clockwise. Okay, so I got this figure in 1932 and I got pressure, volume, and I'm going to go clockwise. I'm going to start at point A and go to B and then to C and then to D and then back to A. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. Okay, uh, starting at B. Oh, bummer. So I gotta start at B. Alright, so get out the eraser. And relabel where I am. Alright, so I'm gonna start at B, go to A, go to D, go to C. Okay, that's the plan. Start at B, A, B, C, and return to B. Using the values given in problem 39, okay, so on problem 39, it says uh, Q, A to C, minus 85 joules. Q, W work A to C work A to C minus fifty five joules uh, work C D A thirty eight joules change in eternal internal energy. A to B, 15 joules. And pressure A is equal to 2.2 pressure B. Okay, so those are all, these are all the given guys from the example before. Okay, describe each leg of the process and then calculate something. Okay, so A, we're going to describe each leg. Okay, so leg uh, B to A. We're going to describe that as isobaric expansion. Isobaric expansion.
Okay, so my pressure stayed the same and I got bigger. Look at it, leg uh, A to D. Okay, leg A to D. And isovolumetric reduction. Iso, iso volumetric uh, iso volumetric reduction in pressure And then we're going to um, do a um, leg D to C. And we're going to call that an isoperimetric baric. Isobaric compression. And then we're going to go look at leg uh, C to B. And we'll call that a um, isovolumetric Did I spell it differently? Uh, isovolumetric expansion in pressure. Okay, and then we'll go back and say, you know, when this happens, um, my um, change in work is zero. I, I've done, I did no work there, and my change in work here is also zero. So if I don't change the volume, I've done no work. Okay. So that, uh, that's the A part of the issue. Now we're going to read the B part of the question. Um, the net work done during the cycle. Net work done during the cycle. All right, so uh, we're going to take our, our things from problem 38. The work done C, D to A is equal work C to D plus work D to A, which is 38 joules. So that being the case, the uh, work done A, B, C, going back the other way, has to be minus 38 joules. Okay. From uh, problem 38 again, um, the work done uh, A, B, C, A, D, C, A, D, C. A, B, C, A, B, C is uh, minus 84 joules, which implies the work done C, D, A, this is a D, um, it's going to be 84 joules the opposite way. Okay, so now we want network. 
work net is going to be the work done B to C plus the work done A to D plus the work done D to C plus the work done C to D. Now, two of these guys are zero. So when the volume stays the same, the work is zero. So C to B is zero. C to B, A to D, A to D. This guy is zero. Um, B, B. A to D is zero. Where is A to D? All right. We go B to A. This is where, um, if you don't can't see enough of your paper, you can't possibly write down what you want to write down. All right. So I'm, I'm starting at B, right? All right? So B to A. A to D. D to C. And C back to A. Now two of these guys are zero. This guy's zero and that guy's zero. Because I, I, there's no change in volume. All right. So um, B to A is my um, 84 joules, and D to C is my minus 38 joules. So the network has to be 46 joules. All right, now we still have a C part of the question to deal with. C part of the question. Um, anybody remember what problem we're on? 40. Uh, the total internal, internal energy changed during the cycle. Right, so, total, and, and this is, um, is always an okay one because it's zero. You end up in the same spot you started with. The total change has to be zero because it's only dependent on temperature change and there is none. D. Um, the net heat flow during the cycle. D. All right, so change in internal energy, which we know to be zero, is going to be the heat net. Um, heat flow plus minus minus the work minus the work that's net. All right, didn't we just calculate the work that was net? Yes, we did. So zero has to be the net heat flow minus. the work, which was 46 joules. So that goes over here, this comes over there, and we have Q net equals 46 joules. Okay, so that's the heat flow out of the system. Uh, problem E, what percent of the intake heat was turned into usable work? How efficient is this cycle? All right. So we're looking at part E. And we see from problem 
39. Uh, we see that uh, Q ADC is minus 68 joules, which is the heat that was exhausted. So that's the heat that was exhausted. The um, Q net, we already decided Q net is uh, 46 joules. We already decided that was going to be this that was going to be the case. So the Q input input must be the 46 net plus the 68 exhausted which is going to be 114 joules so the Q net has to be that efficiency is going to be um, work net divided by Q input A work net uh, 46 joules divided by 114 joules yeah, times 100 percent. And that's going to give us an efficiency of about 40 percent. Well, it's about time we made it through problem number 40. 48 is next. Okay, problem 48. The Pacific heat at constant volume of a, t of a particular gas at room temperature is that. Okay, so 0 0.182 kilocalories per kilogram K. Hi, Calvin. Um, temperature, room temperature would be 20 degrees centigrade. Um, or would it be 25? I don't know. Molecular mass. So M, 34 atomic mass units. What is the Pacific heat at a constant pressure? The Pacific heat at a constant volume is that. What is it at a constant pressure? Okay. So uh, we're in um, 19. So we'll move back in 1908. And we find that um, Hmm. What are we going to find? The uh, heat capacity at a volume is going to be, be the hmm. Oh, there we go. Capital M. What's capital M? Moles in grams per mole. Okay, so that's the atomic mass units. Okay, uh, M C V. And that Q is M C V delta T, which is also N C P 
delta t. Okay. So the heat capacity at a constant volume is MCV. So I got uh, 0 0.034 kilograms per mole times uh, 0 0.182 kilocalories per kilogram Kelvin times 10 to the third calories per kilocalorie. And I end up with 6.188 calories per mole Kelvin. All right, well, I'm not done yet. I'm just, that's just my first step. All right, then I've got that uh, C sub P is equal to, yeah, it's a capital C, capital C on page uh, 511, C sub P is equal to M little c sub p okay so c sub p little c for p is going to be um, capital c sub p over m okay so i've got that and um, hmm Then from equation 1911, I see that C sub P is going to equal R plus C sub V. So I'm going to rewrite this equation C V plus R over M. And then from that, I'm going to calculate my Pacific heat for a constant pressure it is going to be um, 6.188 calories uh, per mole Kelvin plus R. Well, R is the gas constant. We're going to use the 1.99 one. 1.99 1 calories per mole Kelvin. Not per Kelvin, but Kelvin. Um, divided by M. 0 0.034 kilograms per mole. All right, so I look at it and I see that my moles go away and uh, I end up with kilocalories. I end up with calories per kilogram K. Okay, so that looks good. So I put that in my calculator and I end up with um, 241 calories per kilogram K and we probably want it in kilocalories 0 0.241 kilocalories per kilogram Kelvin and then there's a part B to the problem 48B what do you think is the molecular structure of this gas. What do I think is the molecular structure of the gas? Alright, so looking for the, the B part. So I'm going to look at table 
19.4. Okay, so I'm looking at table 19.4 and I see that my C sub V is 6.811. Uh, so I'm looking for something C sub V 6.811. One eight eight, and it looks like H two O. So it looks like like this is going to be H two O. Now that's water, but that's not the question. The question is, uh, it didn't ask what it was. It asked uh, what is the molecular structure. So the molecular structure would be uh, triatomic. Uh, which is obviously a trick question and if anybody told me that it was H2O I'd probably count that right. Okay, number 50 is next. And number 50 A one mole sample of an ideal diatomic gas, 1.00 mole. Ideal gas uh, at one atmosphere. Temperature, 420K undergoes a process in which the pressure increases linearly with the temperature. So pressure times temperature is a linear thing. So pressure is equal to um, some constant times temperature. Okay, so that makes it linear. Find the final temperature and pressure at the final temperature and pressure at 720 K. Oh, not fine. The final temperature is temperature final, pressure final. Uh, 1.60 atmospheres. Okay, determine A, the change in internal energy, B, the work done, and C, the heat added. Assume five active degrees of freedom. Isn't that lovely? Okay, so first thing we're going to do is find A. A. And A is um, the change in internal energy. Okay, so the change in internal energy is equal to um, M C sub V delta T, uh, which is M. 5 over 2R delta T. Hope you have your page open, the right page in the book, which is going to be um, 5 over 2, 1.00 moles, um, 8.31. Four uh, joules per mole K times three hundred degrees of delta T. And when I put that in my calculator, I know it was six thousand two hundred and forty joules. So that would be the change in internal energy. Okay, now the B part wants to know the um, work done. Okay. 
So the work done, work is going to equal the integral of uh, pressure change in volume. So we're going to find that um, and the pressure is linear to the temperature. Okay, so pressure is going to be equal to pressure naught plus some constant times the temperature. Okay, so using the data that we have, we find that that uh, 1.60 atmospheres has to equal um, pressure naught plus some number times 720k and that 1.00 atmospheres has to equal some pressure naught plus A times 470k. Well, uh, this is two equations to unknowns, so I think that I would just put it in my calculator, and my calculator would tell me that uh, A is equal to uh, 2 times 10 to the minus third um, atmosphere per K. And that my pressure naught was going to be minus 0 0.16 atmosphere. Okay. So now we're going to we're going to use PV is equal to nRT. PV is equal to nRT, and we're going to find that the the volume is uh, nRT over P. which is going to be N R over P, P minus P naught over A. Okay, and we're going to rewrite that as uh, N R over A, 1 minus P naught over P. And we're going to come up with dv is equal to nr over a p naught over p squared dp. So when I take the derivative of this with respect to um, p, that's what I get. Work is going to be integral from v1 to v2 of uh, p dv work um, from integral P1 to P2 P N R divided by A P naught over P squared DP. So those two guys are going to be the same thing. And um, I'm going to end up with the uh, work being uh, N R P naught over A integral P1 P2 of DP over P, which is equal to uh, N R P naught over A natural log P2 over P1. All right, now we can throw in all of our values and we end up with uh, one mole, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, P naught minus 0.16 atmosphere, divided by my A, 2 times 10 to the minus third atmosphere per K. And I ran out of room again, so it's going to be times the natural log 
of 1.6 atmospheres divided by 1.0 atmospheres. And we end up with uh, minus 310 joules. Okay, so that's the, the work done by the process. All right, now we're looking at C. And this is problem 50. Um, the heat added to the gas. All right. So we're going to look at our first law of thermodynamics first. And we see that uh, the change in internal energy is going to equal Q minus W. And guess what we've already calculated? We already calculated two of those. So uh, Q is equal to the change in internal energy plus the work. Okay, so that would be 6 to 4 joules from part A plus minus 310 joules from part B giving us 509, 5,930 joules as our final answer. And as I suspected, that assume five active degrees of freedom um, portion of the question um, didn't help me much, did it? Not at all. Oh well, that'll teach me. Number 54. Number 5-4. An ideal monotonic gas consists of 2.8 moles. Okay, so I got uh, 2.8 moles. And I got a volume 0 0.086 meters cubed. Expands um, whatever that word is. Anyway, nice word. I don't, I don't think I'm going to try to pronounce it. The uh, initial and final temperatures are, so temperature initial, 25 degrees K, uh, not K. And my final, temperature final, minus 68 degrees Celsius. Okay, well, we're going to want these in, in um, Kelvin. So this is 297, right? And uh, and the other guy is 205. Okay, 205 Kelvin. So we want to change it to Kelvin before we even read what they want us to do. Find the final volume of the gas. The final volume of the gas. All right, well, um, pressure one, volume one, divided by temperature one is going to be pressure two, volume two, divided by temperature 2. I see 1, 2, 3, 4 knowns. I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 unknowns. Okay, so that means we have to figure out what this fancy word here is. Where is it? 54. Mm -hmm. And we're in section uh, Oh, well. 19. Okay, so this is a slow expansion where Q is zero and the change in temperature is zero. But how can that be when we already have a change in temperature? Uh, 
Okay, the the temperature is going to drop. Okay. Okay, so we're going to use the formulas on page five, fourteen. Okay, that's what we're going to do. I'm going to rewrite this as uh, P1 over P2 is going to be uh, V by M2 temperature 1 divided by by M1 temperature 2. And we're going to say that that uh, P1 pressure 1 gamma is P2 volume 2 gamma. Now, what does that mean? Back to the formulas on page 511. No, not 511. 514. Okay. And um, the gamma is the heat capacity of a constant pressure divided by heat compa uh, capacity of the constant volume. Okay, so that's what that is. Okay, well, that, that is all right. So from that, we get that P1 over P2 is going to be V gamma divided by V2 gamma and um, the 2 goes on top and the 1 goes on the bottom naturally. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Cross multiply. Alright. Now, we know that the gamma is Cp over Cv which is going to be uh, Cv plus R divided by Cv, uh, which is um, 3 halves R plus R divided by 3 halves R, which is going to be 5 over 3. Okay. Now we know what gamma is. Um, V2 over V1, T1 over T2 has to be volume 2 gamma divided by implies that volume 2 gamma minus 1 has to equal volume 1 gamma minus 1 T1 divided by T2. What we're trying to find is volume 2. So volume 2 is going to be volume 1 Uh, to the gamma minus 1 T1 divided by T2 and everything raised to the 1 over gamma minus 1. Okay, so V2 is going to be V1 T1 over T2 and then gamma is 5 over 3. 5 over 3 minus 1 would be 2 over 3. 1 over 2 over 3 would be 3 over 2. Okay, there we are. Now we're upset. 
Um, I know my original volume, 0 0.086 meters cubed. Um, and I already calculated my T1, T2, if I can remember what it is, 297 over 205 raised to the three to the three halves. If I didn't lose control of my marker, three halves. Alright. Um, 0 0.15 meters cubed would be my second volume. Okay. Problem number 62. A copper rod and an aluminum rod of the same length and cross-sectional area are attached end to end. Okay, so I got, uh, got a copper rod and I have an aluminum rod. And they're both the same. Okay, end to end. The copper end is placed in a furnace at 225 degrees centigrade, and the aluminum end is placed in an ice bath 0 0.8, 0, 0 degrees centigrade. Calculate the temperature at the point where the two rods join. All right, well, first of all, we're probably going to need Kelvin, I would imagine. Um, yeah, maybe not, I don't know. It's hard to say. All right, the temperature at the joint. All right, so the temperature here has to be some constant. It's not moving. All right, so I know that to be the case. Um, and the heat flow, so the heat flow through the copper divided by T is going to have to equal the heat flow through the aluminum at uh, some time T. Those, those two things have to be the same. All right, so let's look on section 1910. All right, and this is uh, delta T, delta T. So the heat flow to the point has to be the heat flow away from the point. Those, they have to be the same. And the heat flow is K area T1 minus T2 divided by the length. Okay, so... That's what we're going to use. And so we have K of the aluminum times the area, cross-sectional area, times T1, 2, 2, 5, 0 degrees, minus the temperature in the middle, divided by the length, has to equal K, this is... Um, K of the aluminum times A divided by L, temperature in the middle minus zero. Okay, so those things have to be equal to each other. All right, well, that uh, makes life a little bit better, I suppose. Um, I look at that and I say, well, gee, I got an A on both sides, I got an L on both sides. And I want to know the equation for temperature in the middle. I wonder if I can do that. Um, all right, so I got minus temperature in the middle times KU. I put it on the other side of the equation, and I have the temperature in the middle times 
K C U plus K A L has to equal has to equal two two five K C U. Is that not the case? Yes, it is. So now we have to find out where the K, what the K's are for our uh, transfer function and thermal conductivity is on page 516. So temperature in the middle, 225 degrees centigrade times K of the copper, we use 380. 380 S M C degrees centigrade divided by and this is um, joules joules per all those things divided by um, temperature, the K of the copper, 380, plus the K of the aluminum, another 200 uh, joules per S M degree centigrade. All right, well, Dimensional analysis says uh, those dimensions goes away, those dimensions goes away, and all we have is the temperature in the middle. And we put it on our calculator and we find the temperature in the middle is 174 degrees Celsius. Okay, one more problem, and we will. Um, Call it done with this chapter. Number 66. Okay, approximately how long should it take a 9.5 kilogram piece of ice at zero degrees Celsius to melt when it is placed in a carefully sealed styrofoam ice chest? <laughs> All right of the following dimensions whose wall is uh, 1.5 centimeters thick assume the conductivity of the styrofoam is double that of air and that of the, uh, and the the outside temperature is 34 degrees celsius okay all right hope i can remember those things i probably can't so I'll have to write something down. 66. All right, so I got 9.5 kilograms of ice. I've got, um, I'm at 0 degrees Celsius, so that's good. And I've got uh, 25 centimeters by 35 centimeters by 55 centimeters of an ice chest. Um, I've got uh, 1.5 centimeters is the thickness on the styrofoam ice chest and the temperature outside is um, 34 degrees centigrade. Okay, so the first thing that I would do if I was uh, that type of person is I'd figure out whether or not 9.5 kilograms of ice can fit in the ice chest. And if it can't fit in the ice chest, then the problem can't be solved. Okay, but we're not going to do that today because that would be um, just one of those things. Okay, so assuming that the ice fits in the ice chest and the problem can be solved, then... Um, we have some um, heat that we need to come up with and it's going to be mass of ice um, times the latent heat of fusion for the ice. And we know that Q over T, the change in Q, change in T, 
is going to be k a uh, t1 minus t2 over l and from that we can figure out that the temperature required is going to be q l divided by k a delta t which is um, will be the mass of the ice times okay so we just put everything in the equation and see what we get so my time okay so I've got uh, 9.5 kilograms of ice I've got uh, 3.33 10 to the uh, fifth joules per kilogram required to melt the ice um, I have a thickness of my container 1.5 centimeters that's my L okay the K of the styrofoam is twice that of air so two times um, 0 0.023 joules per second meter degree centigrade times the area of the box okay um, hmm. it would seem um, that the box something like that right it would seem that um, the guy on the bottom is not gonna not part of our effectiveness here and we don't have enough information to say we're losing heat that way so we're gonna lose heat from one two three four and the top all right so our area Two times what? Dimensions. Um, we'll say we're we're twenty five high, fifty five that way, and thirty five this way. Okay, so two times point five five times point. Two five plus two times point two five times point three five plus the area on the top, which is going to be um, what's the area on the top? Five five three five plus 0 0.55, 0 0.35. Okay, so that's my total area. Now I just have to put it in my calculator and see what it is. Um, so, okay, I got my calculator. Um, we forgot the delta T. Delta T is 34 degrees centigrade. Okay, so we got that too. K area delta T. Alright. So how are we going to do this? 9.5 times 3.00, 3.33 E5 times 0 0.015. Alright, so I got the top. Divided by parentheses. 2 times 0 0.023 times close parentheses two actually it's open parentheses two times point five five times point two five plus two times point two five times point three five plus point five five times 
close parentheses times 34 equals all right so I got um, 47.2 times 10 to the third seconds And I'll divide that by 60 squared, and I'll come up with uh, 13 hours. So it's going to take 13 hours to melt the ice under those conditions. Um, and that's assuming that, that we're not losing heat off the, off the bottom of the box. We're losing heat out of the bottom of the box then it would be less time than that. So I'm not, I'm assuming that I'm not losing heat off the bottom, which is probably a bad assumption, but it's the best assumption I have. 